This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. I would say prestige does not have a lot of value to you if you join the program and you're miserable, or you decide to leave the program, or you decide to leave the field altogether. Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, we hear from listeners who need to make tough choices about the next step in their training. Will we lead them astray? Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 193. I'm Joshua Hall. I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Hey there, Dan. Happy May to you. Happy May to you, Josh. We are once again bereft with no ethanol, but I think this weekend you're going to be in town. We are going to the beer store. I will be in town, in your town, and yes, we will replenish the beer supply. And we actually did get a suggestion from a a listener uh, whose question we're going to answer today in the mailbag. You'll remember this, or do I need to remember this, or are you going to remember this when we get to the beer store? Uh, Well, he requested some cider. So I agree. We haven't done a lot of cider on the show, and a lot of people, even if they don't like beer, they like cider. So uh, I think we could do that. Cider is the new IPA. There are so many varieties out there and so many places making it. I think it's the the new hot thing. Not sure if that's true, but we'll go with it. (laughs) <laughs> it took you, took you a while to decide that. <laughs> it's the new hot thing from 2018. How's that? <laughs> I think that might be more like it. But one thing we do want to say is thank you to our sponsor uh, at Promega. Promega wants you to know that they are calling all brilliant minds in the iGem community. They want to help bring your bold ideas to life. That's why they're offering $2,500, that's $2,500, in free Promega products to 10 teams to support the next generation of scientists. They want to hear all about your project, your aspirations, and your team's dedication to the scientific community. Don't hold back. Tell them your story, your vision, and why you believe your project deserves this opportunity. The deadline to let them know is May the 28th, 2023. That's coming up. As we're recording this, Dan, it's May 16th. So uh, coming up, don't delay. Uh, Winners will be announced in June 2023. You can find out all the details of how to apply for this opportunity at promega.com slash resources slash student dash resource dash center. All right, Josh. Well, let us get on with the mailbag questions. They are coming in fast, and so we need to start uh, responding to listeners. All right, Dan. We have some great listener questions this week. Uh, We have some listeners out there facing some tough dilemmas, and they somehow wanted our advice. Uh, <laughs> I guess they haven't found out about the the con, Josh, where we just uh, flip a coin, ask ChatGPT, and then dispense advice. So here goes. I'm going to read the first one. Hi, Dan and or Josh. You got both of us, and we're already off to a good start. Uh, I'm an undergraduate studying biomedical engineering at a tier one but small research university. I began researching in a lab in December 2022 and absolutely love it. And I'm dead set on going to graduate school in three years or so. I am a freshman. I'm currently working 25 to 40 hours in a lab during the semester and have funding for the summer research in the lab. Tracking with me so far, Josh? Wow, 25 to 40 hours a week as a freshman. That's more than you did as a grad student, Dan. (laughs) Too soon, Josh. (laughs) And also true. (laughs) Sorry, carry on. (laughs) All right. Uh, I understand how lucky I am to have gotten on the research track so early and I have very quickly moved from an undergraduate research assistant to leading my own projects and assisting other grad students with experimental design. I have two questions for you that I think will help aid my path in the next few years before applying. One, I will most likely have strong letters of recommendation from my PI, who has lots of connections, but I've seen lots of sources that recommend multiple research-based letters of recommendation. I'm unsure how to go about this. Is this actually necessary? Would this come from working in another lab or from a summer research program at another university? So I think the question here is, Josh, this first question is, uh, this letter comes from Owen, and Owen's doing great, making amazing progress, working hard, excited. 
If Owen stays in this lab for the next four years and only has one letter of recommendation from one research lab, is that okay? Yeah, that's a great question. And Owen is absolutely right. We have said on the show a few times when we've covered how to get into grad school and preparing your graduate school application for PhD programs, that having multiple letters of recommendation from multiple different lab heads or, or faculty that you've worked with worked with in the past can be really helpful for a strong application. But that's not always true, right? I mean, there's some nuance there. I mean, I think in some ways, Owen is a little bit of an outlier, right? I mean, we have someone who, as a freshman, is working (laughs) near full-time, as far as an undergrad goes, in the lab. You know, Owen also uh, had mentioned in some additional information, I think even has name on a publication already or is going to. So you could imagine if you fast forward three more years from now, the amount of the depth of the research experience that Owen uh, will have acquired in this one lab will be pretty great. And I think an admissions committees for graduate school are going to see that and, and think like, oh, wow, this experience in some ways, though an un- though as an undergrad, is is really comparable to what this person is probably going to do in grad school, and they're probably a safe bet. So I guess what I would say is I would push back a little bit on what you mean by do you need to do another research experience in a different lab? Will you need it to get into grad school? Like I said, probably not. If you truly have four years of research in a lab at a research university. But I think one thing we could talk a little bit about is would there be benefit for Owen at some point in experiencing a different research environment, a uh, different mentorship, um, especially this early in your career? Because um, one thing I have seen sometimes, and not always, but with undergrads who did research or experienced research only in one way, in one setting, and this was true for me, Dan, as well, when I came into grad school. right. I worked in one lab in undergrad that I really loved. That's what made me fall in love with research. But then it was like a shock when I actually went to grad school and suddenly experienced research in this different way. And I realized what I actually liked was research done that other way, (laughs) you know? In that lab. In that lab. Yeah. And so I think beyond that, I think it can be beneficial to learn about yourself um, in different environments, maybe discover a new interest, um, just experience different types of mentorship to see what's a better fit for you, Um, or just to recognize that there are different ways of doing things. You've probably experienced that, Dan. You know, you learn how to do things one way, and you think that's the only way to do it, and then you go to a different lab, and you learn some cool new tricks for ways to do a, a technique or think about a problem. All valuable. I remember my first day, I was an undergrad, and I, the first lab I worked in was a plant uh, cell science lab, and they did a lot of plant propagation. And when we would, we would have to dissect these seeds and put them on uh, a growth auger. And the first step that they taught me was you spray your hands with ethanol, like this uh, 70% ethanol solution, you wipe them down, you get into the hood. And so you're doing these dissections, you're scrubbed up, sort of, your hands are disinfected. Mm-hmm. My first day in a toxoplasma lab, toxoplasma being a protozoan parasite, I was like, okay, great. I know exactly what to do. I'm going to passage these cells. I sprayed my hands, and the PI was like, what are you doing? (laughs) First of all, you need to be wearing gloves, which I didn't need to be doing uh, with working with soybeans. And the other thing was, he's like, you're going to dry your skin out and have open cracks in your skin (laughs) where toxoplasma is going to infect you. So I was like, oh, yeah, this is different. And so to your point, Josh... It is not the same the world around, and I think having some of that experience is great. But hold that thought, Josh, because I think the second question kind of addresses this. I think Owen is sensing there may be some other things out there uh, that are limiting his his experience. So the second thing he asks is, I've been looking at graduate school programs across the country with a diverse range of locations so I can maximize my flexibility after undergrad. However, I am open to studying many different subjects, proteomics, medical physics, structural biology, even particle physics or something else. So I have no idea if I should look at different research experiences in different fields, even though my current situation is going so well. How can I make my grad school program search less surface level? And how can I widen my research experience in the future without lessening the impact of my research at the lab I'm currently in? And I think this is kind of encapsulating, Josh, some of what you're saying. Uh, I think Owen is asking, I've got this good thing. Do I 
detach myself from it slightly to go see if there are even better things out there? Or is that going to be an opportunity cost? I'm taking this risk to try something else, and I may give up some really great papers or really great research in the lab I'm in. Well, I think I think these are all great questions to be asking. And honestly, the fact that Owen is asking these questions and reflecting in this way as a freshman is is pretty commendable. And and I think things are going to work out no matter what you decide to do, Owen. But I guess if I if I were you, knowing what I know now, you know, I think doing research during the academic year is great. But I also know there is a lot of benefit and it's a very informative experience to learn how you feel about research doing it full time in the summer. So if you're an undergrad who, you know, you get a taste of research, you think you like it during the academic year, find a way to do it during the summer full time where you can really focus in. You don't have classes, you don't have other organizations or clubs. And I think it can be great to really dive deep into the same lab that you're doing research in during the the school year. I think that could be fantastic. But I think what my advice would be, if you want some practical advice, would be at some point, uh, whether that's the summer after your sophomore year or your junior year, look into some kind of summer research program. There are lots of summer RU programs all across the country at many different institutions maybe target a place that seems cool, maybe target a university uh, that you might have some interest in for graduate school. That can actually be another way to boost your competitiveness for your dream school is chances are if your dream school is a big research school, they probably have a summer research program as well. And how great would it be to have an additional letter of recommendation from a faculty member at that school? Uh, that can be a big boost to your application. So, um, you know, and I'll, I'll say this, and I'm not saying Owen's going to encounter this problem, but I have seen this happen before, Dan. You know, let's imagine you are a faculty member at whatever school Owen is currently currently at in the lab, and you're doing a great job. A lot of times those faculty are really incentivized to keep you <laughs> in their lab doing work for them uh, during the summer and often are not True. super, uh, they're not pushing you out the door to go to summer research programs at other universities and in other labs. I do think people who are really good mentors who want the best for you would probably suggest you do that as well. Um, but my opinion is that at some point, you know, you're just a freshman now at some point, just take one summer and go somewhere else, go to another institution learn some new things, meet some new people, expand your network, and then you can always come back and get more research done. And you're probably still, you're not going to miss out on opportunities to be on a paper or learn some stuff. You're, you're only going to broaden your opportunities. Yeah. And, and I'll throw onto this, Josh, that I, I feel like science is so broad, right? There are so many different things that you could possibly study and you may be drawn to a thing because you heard about it. You know, Josh, you, you got pulled into that microbiology lab as an undergraduate you were interested in microbiology later on because of that. You know, had you had you encountered particle physics from a great professor, maybe that would have pulled you. Who knows? Um, so I, I think Owen is onto something here in terms of not knowing what you don't know, not knowing what what is out there that you might love. And so, if he's really at a tier one university, I can guarantee there are journal clubs, there are seminars going on all over the campus. And what I would just encourage you to do, Owen, is to start going to some of those. And, and, you know, you'll, you'll see a little thread of something that seems interesting and pull on that. Go talk to the people that are doing the research. Find some grad students or postdocs that do that work. Um, you will have maybe 100 conversations and 90 of them, you'll say, wow, I'm really glad I'm not in that field of science. That was so <laughs> boring. But the other 10 might be really interesting and they might lead you down a different path. Um, I, Josh, in one of my rotations for graduate school, I rotated through a uh, proteomics lab and I can, I can look back on that now and see that I was pulled toward the computer side. Um, I didn't end up choosing that lab. I think if I had more experience and more time, I may have found my path to that. But looking back now on that part of my career, there were parts of, of proteomics that really drew me. I was really interested in, in computer programming, but I was not drawn to the math. Like doing the, the complex math and algorithm development, that side of computer science was not interesting to me. So uh, it's a wide world. I understand it now better than I did then. But I think if I had been able to take the time and explore when I was an undergrad, that would have been a much better situation. 
Dan, I couldn't agree more. And, and I'm really glad that you encouraged Owen to also beyond just what we were, we were talking about a few minutes ago between I've got, I'm going to stay in my lab all four years of my undergrad, or I'm going to go do a summer research thing. I truly love that advice you gave Dan of also you're at this research institution. Now look around now, there are lots of opportunities you can have to explore where you are. And, you know, to take it one step further, I would say, Owen, again, you're gaining some great experience. You're putting a lot of hours in, in this lab, you're learning a lot of things. Let's say a year or two down the road, you do what Dan says, and you go to a seminar, you talk to a faculty member that really excites you. And you think, you know what, that also sounds cool. I'd like to explore that. By all means, go do that, right? I wouldn't be mad at you if you said, you know, I spent two years working in this lab, that you're in now. Then I learned about this new thing and I spent my junior and senior year working in this different lab at my institution, right? That's another great option, right? You learn some new things um, and you don't have to completely commit yourself to one lab for the entirety of your undergraduate um, life. You can, if you love it, if you're getting a lot out of it, if you're growing as a researcher and it's moving you towards something you want to do. Great. But uh, don't be afraid to make a move if you find something else interesting. All right, Josh. Well, we will leave that one there and I will read us the next question. This one comes from Jack and he says, hi, Dr. Hall and Dr. Arneman. Thank you for the wonderful podcast that you guys are running. It has been a great help. So Jack has recently been accepted to two programs. We're just going to call them program A and program B. They're both uh, master's degrees in evolutionary biology or ecology. Um, He says, I'm happy that I'm accepted, but I'm now agonizing over which program to commit to. I currently intend to pursue a PhD after my master's and enter academia. But as you pointed out on the podcast, the career plan is subject to change. Jack goes on, initially, I was primarily interested in program A because I liked the available courses and it offered such a unique and focused research experience where participants get to travel to the four partner institutions and are awarded diplomas from two of them, depending on where they do their research project. Also, I've heard that you develop close relations with your cohort in program a so program a there's this mobility masters there's four universities gets to travel around and it sounds like a real team uh, environment now onto program b program b's ranking and prestige are so high and people keep telling me that in the event i choose not to enter academia or pursue a phd the ranking of my master's institution is crucial to securing good employment there's also the argument that since program b is ranked higher than any of the schools partnering in program a The teaching and research quality ought to be superior and the faculty more influential in the field so I get a better chance of publishing papers and can make better connections. In other respects, the other two programs are comparable. The expense is similar and the time spent on research appears to be comparable as well. Do you have any advice on the matter to save me from my suffering? Thanks for taking the time to read my email and I hope you keep up the good work on the podcast. And this is Jack asks us if we're fans of cider. So we'll get to that that cider question in a future episode, Jack. Josh, pr- program A, it's it's the program that I think is compelling to Jack. Program B is the prestigious program that may be better for his career. So what's the answer? Well, Dan, I want to I want to tell a story that immediately came to mind, and this is true, Dan. This happened to me today. This is a conversation that I had today. So, in my group we are hiring for a new position. And today we interviewed someone uh, and this person is currently a faculty member and even served as a department chair. So has really, you know, by all accounts is doing some great things with their academic career. Uh, So anyway, they were going through their science story, their career story. And so they had gone to a PhD program at this school that certainly had good research, but was not what you would classify as a prestigious school. I bet, Dan, if I named this school for you, you've never even heard of it. And so after their PhD, they went to a more high-profile place for their postdoc, and they've had a great career. But I asked them why they chose that school for their PhD, and they said it was because at the time they were finishing undergrad, they liked research, they were looking for a place to go to grad school, and they had interviews at like all the places, right? Like the prestigious places, but also this place. And they said, you know, they had heard that there was stronger community among the grad students and the researchers at that other place. And also it wasn't going to be quite the same high pressure environment as some of those other bigger name schools where they had applied. And that was really appealing to them at that moment, uh, wanting to go somewhere they could feel comfortable and grow as a scientist. 
Um, you know, the research at the place they went was interesting. The faculty seemed supportive, but they said that that was absolutely the right decision for them and probably a big reason they ended up persisting in science and having a successful academic career because of that choice they made to choose the program that felt like the right fit for what they needed and were looking for at the time versus just blindly pursuing this other path because it was a bigger name and what people thought they should do. And so I guess circling back to Jack, what you said in your, your email, I was really struck by the fact that when you describe program A, you used a lot of the I pronoun. You said, I like these courses in program A. I like that I get uh, to travel around, experience these multiple programs. I've heard the cohort is closer. But then when you describe program B, there's really a lot of everybody else, everybody else telling Jack why Jack needs to do this. Yeah, people are telling me, you know, people say, yeah. and, and I guess my opinion is that that is a less compelling reason to choose a program. You know, the program that I'm hearing you say, I'm really excited about this. I chose program A because of all these cool features that excite me and interest me and I think are a good fit. But program B has a cool name. I don't know that. I, I'm not sure that's a great thing to hang your hat on. Yeah, I I think in the U.S. Uh, context, at least, prestige matters. Now Jack is writing from Europe, and I don't have a great sense. So take all of this with a grain of salt. But I don't have a great sense how prestige plays out in a European context in terms of getting a job. So your friends who are telling you program B is the right answer because of prestige might be right. I, I don't have a, an idea of that. But I'm totally with Josh. You sound like program A is what you want. And so, you know, the old trick, Josh, is uh, take your two choices, flip a coin. And <laughs> if you're disappointed, then you know what your choice should have been. Uh, or, or if you're relieved, for example. Um, you know, I, I think that you are interested in program A, but you have this fear of missing out. Or you have this fear that if you had done the prestigious program, your life would have turned out differently. Um, and, and so I'm kind of with Josh on this one, that the right answer for you is to go with the one that you are drawn to. Um, I think we could, the, the reason that I can defend this, Josh, is because I think if we got an email from somebody that says, I want to be the the Nobel Prize laureate in whatever my <laughs> field is, and I am willing to like... I want to stay in the lab for 80 hours a week and I want to publish before anybody else does. Like there, there's that sort of, um, I'm out for blood scientist. That's how my PI used to describe it. He's like, you want to taste blood and hope it's not your own. That was who my PI was. <laughs> there are people like that. I think my PI went to Yale in my undergrad. So anyway, the point is there are people for whom program B is the right answer. There are people for whom program A is the right answer. It sounds to me, Jack, like program A is the right answer for you. Um, what I'm going to encourage you to do that will help put your mind at ease a little more is to try to talk to people that are in both programs. Find out. Ask them questions. Do the students finish? Did their cohort all finish? Uh, does it feel supportive? This doesn't have to be something you hear from somebody. This is something you can talk to these students directly and understand what their research is like, what their training is like. Um, what kind of jobs do the people go on to get? If you had asked me about that from people from my program, I could tell you the people who just graduated, what did they go on to do? Um, that information is all out there for you. You may be able to use LinkedIn if you can't get in contact with these people, but I really encourage you to go talk to people from both programs and figure out whether this fits into your lifestyle and the career you want. I love that, Dan, of, of going out and, and collecting some data for yourself. So we move this out of uh, hearsay, and we move this out of conjecture and more into facts and, and reality. A simple thing you could do, I think, to get at what Dan is suggesting is if you're tr if you're if one of your concerns or hesitations with saying yes to program A is this notion well joining this high ranking prestigious program is the key to securing good employment as you say well ask folks in charge of program A what are some things your alumni go and do where do they work are they all unemployed are they all on the street are they all at Starbucks uh you know, what are they doing with their degree, right? I bet you used they to collect that data, didn't you? Uh, we did, and we did, and we do. And I, f my strong uh, belief is, if I had to guess, is that there are well, actually, no, it's not even a guess. 
Uh, there are plenty of people. I think if you also talk to people who are in what you would describe as good careers, who have good employment, if you asked all of them, if you surveyed them, where did you go to school? What programs did you go to? They didn't all go to program B. I feel pretty confident. A good bet, Josh. I'll take those odds. Yeah. And so, you know, I guess to wrap this up, Jack, if if for you, what program B mostly has going for it is prestige, I would say prestige does not have a lot of value to you if you join the program and you're miserable or you decide to leave the program or you decide to leave the field altogether, um, which is not to say that you're definitely going to have a bad experience there because there are certainly great people at prestigious universities and institutions also. But I would like to see you put heavier weight on the things that excite you in this moment about a program and not what other people say. Yeah, you don't want to show up and your first experience is regret. Like, oh, why did I choose program <laughs> B? I, I would have been so much happier in A. That's not a good, a good headspace to be in. Um, but anyway, please, Jack, let us know. It sounds like you've listened to the show for a little while. Please write back. Let us know what you picked. Uh, if it was a bad <laughs> advice that we gave you, don't write in. We don't want to know about it. Ten years from now, Jack chose program A, and now he is unemployed. <laughs> Unemployable. Unemployable. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. I don't either. All right, Josh. Well, we have lots more questions in the mailbag. Uh, I, unfortunately, there is a thunderstorm rolling through my area, and so uh, I'm afraid it's going to interrupt our podcast recording. So I'm going to cut it there, and we will have to get to these other letters in the next episode. Is that all right with you? That's okay with me. And Dan, I am giddy with excitement about seeing you in just a few days, having some fun, restocking the ethanol, probably consuming some ethanol. Uh, it's going to be a good time. Uh, folks, do have an ethanol you'd like for us to try on the show or any other beverage for that matter. We will not restrict to ethanol. Uh, if you tweet at us or email us very soon, we'll probably be going to the store in about four days. So... <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> All right. And if you have a question or a topic idea, we would love to hear it. You can email us, podcast at hellophd.com, or send us a tweet at hellophd. If you'd like to support the show, the best thing you can do is to share it with a friend, a lab mate, or your department listserv. We reach new listeners entirely by word of mouth, so we need your help. If you'd like, you can also become a patron. J just go to our website, hellophd.com, and click the Become a Patron button, or visit patreon.com slash hellophd. We'd appreciate the beer or other beverage money, and thanks to the ongoing support from our patrons. Maybe we should try kombucha sometime, Dan. I do like kombucha. I can, I'll can. i steal you some from work, Josh. We have some at work. Please do. I know very little about kombucha. I, I'm not even sure if I've had kombucha, Dan. All right, Dan. Well, I will see you soon, and we'll catch up with our listeners next time. See you next time.